looking at the world through the leaves of a 100-year-old tree. The name of the book is The Witness Tree, and the author, Linda Mapes, is, is here with us. Linda, welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. What an interesting book. When I first heard about The Witness Tree, I thought, okay, so this is a fiction book about going out in the woods. It's not, is it? Anything but. No, it's a true story. Well, speaking of a true story, let's go straight to the New York Times then, because here's what the New York Times said about it. Uh, said that uh, the book was ambitious, or the author was ambitious in The Witness Tree, which gets at sweeping ideas by looking at a 100-year-old uh, oak tree in Massachusetts. Among many other subjects, uh, forest regeneration, acorn production, pollen records, Mapes has plenty to say about our early spring. Climate change, the trees, streams, and puddles, and birds, bugs, and frogs attest is not a matter of opinion or belief. It is an observable fact. What observable fact are they talking about? This is the testimony of nature. I'm a reporter at the Seattle Times. I'm the environmental reporter. Mm -hmm. And I set off to try to find a fresh way to tell the climate change story, not about hearings or climate marches or dueling politicians. I was seeking the quiet testimony of living things. I wanted to see what nature showed us about how life on Earth is changing because our climate is changing. and. The more I looked, the more I found. And a tree, as it turns out, is a very, very articulate witness to climate change. You went out and found a tree, but not just any tree, <laughs> a very special tree. This is so true. I was at the Harvard Forest, which is in Petersham, Massachusetts. That's mm -hmm. about an hour and a half west of Cambridge. And a lot of people, even at Harvard, don't know that Harvard has the Harvard Forest, which was founded in 1907 as a research forest. And it is a department of Harvard University, like history or English or anything else. And the Harvard Forest today is 4,000 acres, and it's a natural native New England wood. And researchers, scientists, students, artists, writers come from all over the world to study everything you can imagine, from landscape history to gas exchange in the tree canopy at the Harvard Forest. And while it looks like a normal natural wood, very quickly, anywhere you go, you realize this is a lot more than that. It's an outdoor laboratory. It's an outdoor classroom. You'll hear a drone buzz overhead. You'll see a tube, a PVC tube sticking in the ground. And someone will suddenly come along and take the end off. And they'll shove a camera in there to see how the roots are growing. Or maybe you'll see what I saw, which were bank security cameras on towers, 120 feet in the air over the canopy. And they're not looking for robbers, they're looking for leaves. And they're so this observing. Is, this is a living laboratory. It's a living laboratory, that's mm. right. And that's what you found. That is what I found. I was there as a Bullard Fellow in forest research pursuing an idea that actually sprouted very acorn-like <laughs> while I was a fellow in science journalism at MIT. And when what I was- is, What is science journalism? Well, you know, I think it's a bit of a misnomer when we say investigative reporting or science journalism. It, I don't know, I think it's a prettified, fancified word that really is just about a focus. It's journalism, like any other kind, fact-based, interview-based, research-based, narrative, but the focus is about science. And in my work at the paper, I cover the environment, and a lot of that winds up having to do with science, data, um, knowing how to find and utilize research. So for me, a science journalism fellowship was a real opportunity to hook up with experts and pursue an idea. My idea was looking for climate change in the natural world. And I found a professor at Harvard University named Andrew Richardson, mm -hmm. who was interested in phenology, which is the study of the seasons. Yep, I never heard that before. I needed to <laughs> look that one up. So that's one of the many ologies yes. uh, that is um, in your book, basically. Yes, yes. And phenology is a kind of a funny word. It's sort of an awkward word. It sounds mm -hmm. like that fake science phrenology. Phenology is the study of regularly occurring events in nature on a seasonal timing, croaking frogs, migrating birds. And the reason we care about phenology, this is a very old practice. It's probably one of our oldest biological records. And it goes all the way back at least to the eighth century in the monks of Kyoto, keeping track of when the cherry blossoms flowered. Come fast forward to um, England and the Marshall Marsham Estate and keeping track of 
the arrival of the cuckoo and other signs of spring. And the family kept that record for many, many decades. And in the United States, of course, Thomas Jefferson was a very famous um, cataloger, observer of nature at Monticello, keeping track of what was in blossom and which bird was coming and how the garden was going. So this, this practice of phenology is, has long been with us and it's mm -hmm. global. People <coughs> always have always done it. But it has a new application today because in the era of climate change, what mainstream science had long ago dismissed as just kind of a hobby for dotty gardeners and <laughs> birders, suddenly had a whole new meaning because you could look at seasonal timing in nature and see the footprint, the fingerprint of climate change. Well, let's, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about a lot from the witness tree, but I've got to talk a little bit about your writing. I'm going back to uh, a column you wrote from 2004, and the headline is Tribe's Letter Deepens a Dilemma Over a Project. And this is about uh, the Lower Elwha, mm -hmm. uh, the Lower Elwha Clallam tribe, as a matter of fact, where they had asked the State Department of Transportation to find a lo new location mm -hmm. for a facility that was helping in the building of a bridge. And I noticed a quote from uh, the House Majority Leader at that time, it was Lynn Kessler, and she said she hopes the state can still use the Port Angeles site. And there was a quote from her on this, and I wonder if she would say the same thing today. I'm terribly conflicted on all of this. I honor the tribe and their history, but I still think compromise should be reached at that site. We have dumped a lot of money in there, and we're knocking on heaven's door with that bridge. Ooh. Yeah. Ooh. ooh. You know, it, it's so interesting to read that quote today, given the history we've just watched go by uh, with DAPL, the Dakota Access Pipeline. Mm -hmm. I mean, this, this was a situation where you had a very different outcome from this bridge, which was the Hood Canal Bridge. and. In the end, the state walked away from that site. They did what the tribe asked and found another place. And it, was it about the environment? Was it about their ancestry? Was it all of those things? It was about burials. It was about finding more than 300 burials at a state construction site. Oh. You know, and at a certain point, you're done. <laughs> yeah. So I, I have to ask this. Um, as I, when I was a child growing up, there was this incredible advertisement on television that was a Native American, and he had a tear in his eye, and we all know the ad, uh, and because they study it in schools, <laughs> and the, the tear in the eye was over garbage being thrown out of a car. Do Native Americans care more about the Earth, our planet, than non-Native Americans? I would hesitate to say more. I would say they care about it in a different way. There is a, a central attachment and uh, identity with the natural world that comes from spiritual teachings. They regard, and obviously I'm grossly generalizing here, every culture is different, each tribe, each person, but there is a, an overarching tradition of seeing animals, plants, trees as relatives, living members mm. of family, and as teachers, as a matter of fact, and also uh, providers of spirit helpers. And so there's a very intimate relationship with the natural world. It is not something out here or distant. It is absolutely a place in which um, life is embedded. And, and you cannot do well, you cannot be a successful person without a um, thriving and respectful relationship with the natural world. And it isn't only about provision of, of food and material culture as it, as it was. It is truly um, a more holistic connection to the living world. Let's go back to the book then. And Kirkus Reviews uh, from New York says this, understanding trees simultaneously as utility and commodity, as ritual and relic, as beings with agency and sustainers of life, the author, Linda Mapes, illustrates how they have found their waves in ways into our homes and memories, our economies and language, and she reveals their places in our entangled future. I've never looked at a tree that way. I looked at a tree as something to climb or something to, you know, get out of the harmful rays of the sun mm -hmm. under or something to just enjoy. Mm -hmm. Never quite looked at it the way you're talking about it mm -hmm. today. I'll never look at trees the same way again. And my intention in focusing my story on a single tree was to let it organize for us a very um, rich exploration of a place and a hundred year sweep of history over which time our relationship with nature changes quite a lot. So my trees sprouted in about 1905 at the height of deforestation in New England. People like to say, think of Thoreau, Henry David Thoreau, 
as a pan with a pencil. And he wasn't. He was writing at a time when trees were being felled all around him as farmers were clearing the land. And he complained about that. He would say, thank God they can't cut down the clouds. And he <laughs> lamented the loss of the nobler animals, by which he meant the larger animals, the bear, the deer, the moose. In his day, um, the biggest animal in the woods was a muskrat. Nobody had seen a deer in a generation. To me, to tell the story of the transformation of the New England landscape, landscape a six-state area cannot be overstated since the time of Thoreau. Today, we are seeing a fantastic, unintentional rewilding of a vast sweep of country. And with the return of trees has come the return of the animals. Those animals Thoreau lamented losing, they're back. And they're back in such numbers, they're virtual pests. You have bears hibernating under decks in Northampton. You have moose crossing signs along Route 2 out in rural New, Ham in New Hampshire. Can and we all coexist? We can. It is all about how. I mean, the thing that was so revealing and inspiring to me in getting to know my tree, getting to know this forest, was to realize that this is possible. Look at Washington State. We are the dam-busting pioneer. We took out two dams on the Elwha River out mm -hmm. on the Olympic Peninsula. And in fact, there's an article from you, October 17th, 2016, about that. Uh, you said, uh, the goal of the restoration and this getting rid of this dam is a multi-species revival of the entire watershed, mm -hmm. three quarters of which is in the Olympic National Park. Taking down the two dams reopens 70 miles of some of the best spawning habitat mm -hmm. for salmon. Uh, the largest ever anywhere, the $325 million federal dam removal project on the Elwha took out the Elwha and uh, Glines Canyon dams beginning that, that were built in 1905, yes. or ni actually 1910, Here's to provide year. hydropower for Port Angeles and the Olympic Peninsula. What's happened? Ha! Ah, this is spectacular. Anyone who hasn't been there should go. It is a transformation on a watershed scale. First of all, the fish are booming back. We're seeing fish all the way up into the highest reaches of the watershed for the first time in a century. Not only that, but because the fish are back, the birds are back. People who have known the lower Elwha since they were kids say they have never seen so many eagles in the lower river. And that's because they're feasting on the eulicon, the candlefish, these wonderful oily forage fish. They're back in the river now in the wintertime. Not only that, but the birds, dippers, those magical aquatic songbirds unique to the Olympic Peninsula, they used to be migratory. Well, you know what? Now they're sticking around. They mm. stay in the river. Is there anybody that says that this is a bad thing? We don't care. This, you know, we don't care if we lose the snail darter or not. Yes, yes, yes. But I'll say this: I think they're wrong. And the reason I think that's wrong is because we need nature. This actually isn't optional. You know, this idea that if global warming happens and the planet cooks somehow will be magically okay. I, I, I got news for you. The, the, the laws of physics apply universally. And this is about physics, pure and simple. You add more CO2 gas to the atmosphere, guess what? It's going to get warmer just because of the properties of CO2 in the atmosphere and how it behaves. And we now have the highest levels of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere in 800,000 years. No human has ever breathed this atmosphere. So no one should be surprised that we, for the third year in a row, just notched the highest surface temperatures on Earth. Wow. Let's yeah. go back to the Kirkus book review. They said, seamlessly blending elements of physics, ecology, biology, phenology, sociology, and philosophy, Mapes skillfully employs her oak as a human-scaled entry point for probing larger questions. And i got to ask you this. You start off your book by talking about your tree. <laughs> How did this mighty 100-year-old oak become your tree? This was an intimate exploration. I climbed it. I visited it in all seasons, all times of day. On nights that I, if I couldn't sleep, I'd go out there and I'd lie under the tree and just think. Watch the stars between the moving boughs of the tree. Watch the way the moonlight came between the trunks of the tree in the forest. I got to know that tree so well that I would watch the rain pour off of its boughs and rainstorms and just let it tickle my face. I would watch these insects on their urgent errands going up the bark with a little tiny hand lens so I could really see their little tiny insect faces. 
I would lie under the tree and just watch to see who would come along. A chipmunk, maybe, to bury a nut. Or perhaps a swallowtail butterfly. It was exquisite. You have to remember, I'm a daily newspaper reporter, so <laughs> my daily life doesn't look a lot like that. To have time to do the sweet nothing that is everything that makes life worth living. To really get to know a single tree well, to me, was a spectacular privilege. And so I do think of it as my tree, but I didn't name it. <laughs> I don't call it a he or a she. It is its own sweet self. And, and we do have life. a picture of it. So yes. So we, we uh, heard that somebody had actually found it. I would like for you to read from the book, if okay. you would. And here's this is from page 66, uh. if anybody wants to read along. This is about one of those nights uh, when I couldn't sleep and the moon was full. So I just um, put on my slippers and in my nightgown, walked out to the tree. Here's what I saw. More than a century stood here in the big oak. Through two world wars, farms gone to forest, a carbon and digital age begun and still surging, and the oak just steadily grew on, not unchanged, but persisting to each next day. I thought of it, shut down now for the night, a solar-powered miracle at rest during the reign of the moon. Could I sense the big oak and the lives all around breathing just like me? What if the respiration of trees was visible, diffusing into the night sky in a soft, golden cloud? Perhaps then the interconnectedness of our lives, easy to forget, would be more visible, our shared living breath and connection to this earth more apparent. I had never realized that trees have daily schedules as surely as we do, with activities particular to the hour and resting cycles that correspond to day and night. Graphed on paper, a day in the life of a tree looks like a bell-shaped curve, from a quiescent dawn to its height of activity at noon, winding down to its repose at sunset. I lay under the tree to look up into its crown, the leaves shut tight for the night, like a house waiting for morning. You asked in the book this question, surrounded by trees in our lives, what do we really know about what they're doing all day. And I, as I ask that question, I also want to take you back to your daily life, which is not as mystical as that. <laughs> your daily life was spent in part at the Dakota Access Pipeline. <laughs> yes. And then you also wrote a column about, you know, the Dakota Access Standing Rock North in Canada. Mm. So how does this all fit together? I think it all fits together actually through intimacy. I mean, I'm driven as a writer and as a reporter to to intimacy, to get to know people, places. I'm a how does it know person, how does it work person, a how do I get to know them person. And you know, with the tree, that was my approach. I wanted to get to know it very deeply. It's function all the way literally to the cellular level. At the Dakota Access Pipeline, you know, similarly, my job there was to be embedded with the protesters and water protectors, as they called themselves, and deeply understand what they were going through what they were trying to make happen, what this fight meant to them, win or lose. And similarly, uh, with the actually much larger tar sands pipeline, not only proposed, but approved right across the border here, uh, Kinder Morgan's project, the, the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion, that was really interesting to me because in Canada, it's a little bit different. I mean, the First Nations there have virtual veto power over these projects. And while some of the First Nations have signed on or they've signed some kind of cooperative agreements, I haven't actually read them, so I don't know exactly what they say. Uh, you have the First Nations um, tribe of Salatooth right there outside of Metro Vancouver saying, they'll lie down in front of the bulldozers. They'll, they'll die before they'll let this happen, that it's been given the okay by the government, that doesn't mean it'll ever be built. And I think uh, that the Dakota Access Pipeline is, is just a, it's almost a warm up for what we're gonna be seeing out here in the Northwest. I mean, if that's what building a pipeline looks like in rural North Dakota, I can't wait to see what it looks like in Metro Vancouver. I mean, there are already um, training camps underway for direct citizen action. And um, I don't know what's gonna happen, but it's not gonna be small. Hmm. I have to tell you that during that the entire news cycle from the about the middle of 2016 mm -hmm. to now, I sort of 
tuned out. Mm -hmm. uh, the Dakota Access Pipeline and the protests and all of the things that were going on, mm -hmm. you know, maybe it was bad of me to tu tune out, but I didn't even follow it. What are they protecting? You said they're water protectors. Are they protecting our environment? And who's the bad guy here? Well, this, this is such a sad story because, you know, there's history here. Th this is the Great Sioux Nation. And these people, the Lakota, Dakota people, were run off their territory, murdered, um, brutalized mm -hmm. deliberately by us uh, because we wanted what they had from the Black Hills to all the rest of uh, what we wanted to run the railroad through their territory. And, you know, this history, it's, it's not a history a lot of us were taught in school. And it's hard to confront, actually. It, it was not a matter of these sort of primly negotiated treaties and so now it's all okay. These, these in many cases were um, treaties that didn't make any sense and then weren't even kept when after they were made and um, Indian people were brutalized, murdered. Um, I mean, th this was war. It's the, it's the right word. And I think maybe we thought there were just a few of those, you know, here well, and there. Was there gonna be a, an American politician and a Canadian politician come along and say what, uh, what Lynn Kessler said you know, 13 years ago and say we've dumped a lot of money in there and we're knocking on heaven's door with that pipeline? We'll see. Okay. We'll let's see. Let's go back to the book and the Kirkus Review. They said a meticulously, beautifully layered portrayal of vulnerability and loss, mm -hmm. renewal and hope, this extensively researched yet deeply personal book is a timely call to bear witness and act in an age of climate change denial. If I was reading an, another, or if I was translating this, mm -hmm. I would say, Kirkus thinks that you have found intimacy. Mm. That's and good. And portrayed it. That's great. <laughs> um, climate change denial. A and I know this is big in, in politics, or it is to some. And I've sat on the sideline and I've said, I don't care who causes it. Mm -hmm. I said, it's here, mm -hmm. so we have to deal with it. Mm -hmm. and, we'll, and everybody knows that we are damaging the ozone every single day. Mm -hmm. Why is that not a focus? I mean, I, it seems to me to, to be completely common sense. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> I absolutely couldn't agree more. And I was very aware in the writing of this book that I didn't want to preach and I didn't want to scold. And I didn't want to scare because I think people just shut down to yeah. all three of those. So. My pathway... Or they vote heavily. <laughs> right, <laughs> right, but how? I mean, my pathway was through wonder and delight. I, I wanted to open eyes to the beauty of the natural world and its fragility, really, that, that what we see being disrupted are these delicate relationships of seasonal timing. Nothing in nature is there randomly. It is there when it is there for a reason. The pollinator and the flower the insect and the bird. They, they are there in a, in a synchrony of timing that matters. And if those start to separate, suddenly the bird doesn't have the insect to feed its young, or the bee doesn't have the, the flower that it specifically needs to get the nectar for its brood. I mean, these things are delicate. Can we go to the second reading that we prepared? Please. Starts right there. On average, spring is coming earlier Fall is coming later, and winter is being squeezed on both ends. Everything in the woods reflected these changes, from the level of water in the vernal pools and springs, to when the black flies were biting, the ground frozen, or leaves budding out, or finally coming off the trees. It wasn't a matter of conjecture or political argument, the discussions of who does and doesn't believe in climate change, in editorial pages, news reports, and congressional debates, frame this all wrong. Climate change, the trees, streams, and puddles, and birds, bugs, and frogs attest, is not a matter of opinion or belief. It's an observable fact. Leaves don't lie. Frost isn't running for office. Frogs don't fundraise. Pollinators don't put out press releases. What O'Keefe, my collaborator in this project, had compiled while taking all those walks in the woods was the testimony of an unimpeachable witness, the natural world, including the big oak, my witness tree. Here's what, you're, what I'm hearing you say. I, I'm hearing you say, look, you, you don't need to read anything else uh, uh, about it. You just need to go and look for yourself and open up your eyes and you'll see that it's happening. 
And that's why there was an article that you wrote, and it was about uh, sewage, raw sewage that was going into the Puget Sound. And it was kind of like, but nobody's saying anything about it. Um, and it's, I, I'm, I'm wondering if you can't see it, does that mean it's not there? I think that's a really um, powerful point. People are um, very in the moment animals. And with this terrible pollution in Puget Sound after the flooding of the West Point treatment plant, here's the thing, you couldn't see it, you know? I mean, it was going out an emergency outfall in 35 feet of water, about a 200 feet offshore. A lot of it was going on at night. In the wintertime, there's a lot of very fast moving water and uh, it's the sewage is very, very diluted with rainwater and storm water. So it's not like there was things on the beaches or floating or, you know, there was some transient um, spikes in uh, E. coli bacteria, that sort of thing. Water quality m measuring tells us that. Those were some of the emergency moments. You know, there were three emergency bypasses in which the just totally untreated raw sewage spilled into the Puget Sound, about 300 million gallons. That's a lot. Mm. Right. But then there was an ongoing impact every day amounting to hundreds of tons of solids going out through the larger, deeper, further away outfall, disinfected, but not treated in the way that they normally would be. And in fact, normally they would not be dumped there. They'd be going through secondary treatment and going into digesters and being trucked away after being greatly sanitized. In this case, they're going into the sound and they were going into the sound every single day for more than a month and they're still going into the sound. Mm. This thing's not fixed yet, but yet, you know, I went to, I don't know how many public hearings about this. There was nobody from the public there. And, I, you know, I, I'm a reporter. People call me and freak out about things, all kinds of things. They get <laughs> mad. They're upset. It didn't happen. It was very strange to me. So the big thing then is, is what can people do? And unfortunately, we only have about a minute and a half left. <laughs> so I got to get to page 204. We need a tree culture, a nourishing mutualism that embeds us in creation, working with one another in collaboration with nature to sustain us in our common home. Is that what people can do, become part of a tree culture? I think so. Look, I mean, I was so inspired by the genius of this tree. Here it is for 100 years in the same spot, still productive, still thriving, still growing, contributing to the community around it, which, by the way, is a completely diverse culture of many species, both animal and tree. If the tree can do it, why can't we? Well, I encourage everyone to read about it for yourself. The name of the book is The Witness Tree. Linda, thank you very much for being thank with us. Thank you so much.